G'day guys, I'm Matt Brand, and this... Oh! Oh! It's this 2021 Toyota Supra! The 2021 Toyota Supra has only just gone on sale here in Australia. We are very late to the party. And it brings with it some additions that make 2020 owners pretty pissed off. You see, it comes with more power and a stiffened chassis for better handling. So, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a better car. And considering it only came out for the 2020 model year, owners are a bit pissed. Which is fair enough, to be honest. It's totally fair enough. Oh, but the power boost... <laughs> <laughs> it means that it now meets the BMW Z4, a car which this is pretty much based on. I say pretty much, that's what this car is. <laughs> it's a BMW Z4 under the skin. So if you own a 2020 Toyota Supra, should you be mad? Well, let's talk about that. The extra power and stiffening though do come at a $2,600 cost. And that means that the Toyota Supra now starts at just over 95,000 Australian dollars. And this GTS here with all the bells and whistles that's over 105,000 Australian dollars. I say all the bells and whistles, don't worry, it's not a BMW with its optional extras as I turn this corner. You have $2,500 Nürburg Macrae paint, which you absolutely want to spec. It is beautiful. And you also have a $2,500 Alcantara interior pack, just means the seats are Alcantara. Powering the Mark V Supra is a beautiful, BMW inline six cylinder turbocharged engine, the B50A, which is a magnificent engine. And with that power bump, <laughs> it pumps out 285 kilowatt of power and 500 newton meters of torque. The zero to 100 or zero to 62 miles an hour is. <laughs> .1 seconds. Now all the Supra's power is sent through a buttery smooth eight-speed automatic torque converter transmission, which is just one of the best applications of an eight-speed torque converter. It is just, it's perfect. Upshifts are seamless, downshifts are seamless, but it can go really hard in sport mode. And of course, being a true sports car, all of that power goes through a limited slip differential through to the rear wheels only. And that means that on days like today where it has been pouring with rain, yeah, it can be a bit frightening, but in a very controllable way, of course, I have not turned off traction control for today and, and, and you don't need to. It'll allow a little bit of slip, but it'll pull you straight back in if it starts to notice any sort of major slipping of the wheels. But I want to talk about what really makes the Supra special in my eyes, and that's just the way it looks. Now I'm on record saying that the Toyota Supra is the most beautiful car I have reviewed on the channel, and I stand by that. While nothing has changed for the 2021 update on the exterior, nothing needed to, because in my opinion, it was pretty close to perfect. Excuse me, here while I give it a bit of a, a bit of sauce. Ah! Oh! Whoa. The front is just incredible, and it starts at the tip because this thing is shaped like a fighter jet with the front coming into this one point at the front. Beautiful. And it looks like a fighter jet too with its huge bonnet. Absolutely gigantic. The headlights of the Mark V Supra are simply iconic. The LED daytime running lights are gigantic, <laughs> like literally span like the entire front of the Supra. But the LED lamps are really functional. On each lamp, there are seven individual LEDs and they blank out for oncoming traffic. It's almost like a matrix LED, but not quite, but <laughs> it achieves pretty much the same thing. And that's been great. I've been driving around country Victoria over the last few days and at nighttime, it is a godsend. The bottom of course is really cool. You have a very aggressive front splitter and spoiler and the grill is split three ways, which is a very nice look. And to be fair, most of it is actually plugged up and, and that's across the entire Supra. Everywhere you see a vent, it's mostly a fake vent plugged up for apparently aerodynamics. We've also heard other explanations like it's great for tuners, but who knows what the truth is. Regardless though, I don't really care because I just think it looks amazing. Excuse me here while I give it a bit of a please subscribe source. Ah! Whoa! This thing should be called the Widowmaker. The side profile though is absolutely my favorite. I think it looks incredible. Here we are going up the twisties. Excuse me here for a second. This isn't a, this isn't a source moment. This is a, a twisties moment. 
haven't had one of these before. <laughs> wow, this car is just, it handles incredibly. Fun fact, it has a shorter wheelbase than a Toyota 86, and as a result, you just get some of the best handling of any car, it is amazing. Now, as I said, the car has the optional matte gray paint, and you want that because it makes all the body lines pop in any condition, especially the huge fender flares at the back. They are massive, and I've stuck a GoPro on there, and look how cool it looks. You can get some awesome perspectives, but it is that thick. Being the GTS, top of the range, you get the 19-inch forged alloy wheels, which are a pretty cool look. Not the most amazing, but they're pretty awesome. And new for 2021, you have the Super Badge printed onto your brake calipers, and apparently that gives it 6,000 more horsepower. And then the rear again is, is just awesome. Up top is the signature ducktail spoiler of the Mark V Supra. Beautiful. It's like, it's my favorite application ever of a ducktail spoiler. Below it is the Supra badge, which is the same as what was on the Mark IV Supra, and it looks awesome. And then the tail lights are pretty cool. Below them are weird fake vents. Uh, that, one, that one annoys me. But the rear diffuser is really, really cool. Very aggressive. And the coolest part about it isn't the dual exhaust. It's really that rain light down the bottom. In Australia, it is the brake light and the reverse light. In other markets, it's just the reverse light. Must be regulations, but it looks awesome. Nuts good. Now, while the exhausts are massive, they look awesome, they actually do not sound as good as the 2020 variant. I don't know what they've done, but the sound, while loud, it can be quite droning. There aren't as many crackles, farts, pops. Here's a short compilation from my first Toyota Super Review, the 2020. And now, here's the 2021, still enjoy it. They've done something and muted it. I don't know that for sure, but it just doesn't crackle, fart and pop as much. And that is a shame because that was one of my favorite things about the last 2020 Supra. Now, to to say that the Supra's biggest competitor is the Porsche Cayman, but I wanna know what you guys think. What do you think looks better, this Toyota Supra, or do you prefer the looks of the Porsche Cayman? Let me know down in the comments section below. All right, let's move on to the interior. And as soon as you step in here, if you are familiar at all with any modern BMW, it's a BMW within here. Now, that's not a bad thing, because as I've said in many reviews, BMW have the best quality, fit and finish, beautiful interiors out there. And this is no different. You have soft touch materials absolutely everywhere. And even though it is a sea of black plastic, it, it looks great. Excuse me here, we're going up a few more twisties. I just want to see how this thing, this handles, oh, even in wet, it just hooks up. <laughs> I don't usually come out, as you guys know, to the back roads of, of Victoria. I'm usually in the Peen Highway fiend, but this is just, this is just something else. Oh, I gotta do this more often. Anyway, back to the interior, and something I absolutely love is the carbon fiber in the center console. It looks so cool and just really helps to elevate the sportiness of the interior. But then even when you're looking at that, you look at the gear selector. I mean, that's about as BMW as it comes. As is the control for the iDrive system, which is, of course, a BMW product. Uh, but again, I, I just could, I couldn't care less because BMW makes some of the best interiors out there. So I, I couldn't complain any less. In terms of ergonomics and practicality, the steering wheel is tilting and telescoping, of course, and the seat is adjustable hugely. Now, as you can... Oh! My God. Now, as you can see behind me, there is a pretty big brace bar that sits right behind the front seats. And as a result, you can't really pull the seat back very far. You can if you push the seat forward and then you put it back, but the seats aren't programmed to know that that's there. So often you'll start hearing this like crunching noise and it's the seat hitting that. But at five foot 11, I'm super comfortable. I have plenty of headroom. If I did want to put on a helmet, it is certainly possible. Storage space though is only just decent. You've got a couple of cup holders here and a little storage area back there. You've got a couple of very, very small door pockets. But hey, the glove box is a good size. So uh, I don't know, storage isn't this car's strong point as, as you can imagine. This thing is pretty much a supercar. This steering wheel though is, is pretty good. It's not the best. Actually, I just reviewed the GR Yaris, so go watch that if you haven't after this review. But that thing had a completely OEM Toyota steering wheel 
and uh, and that was incredible. This is less so, it's weirdly thin. Now, it's totally fine, I don't hate it, but it's not the most comfortable steering wheel I've ever held onto. Good news is though, it is an extremely functional steering wheel. The buttons are super, super easy to use, and I do like the paddle shifters, they're pretty cool. The instrument cluster, while basic, is really good. In the center is a giant, beautiful tachometer. To the left is a speed reader, which is just how you want it. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you can show things like navigation and well, that's all I found function for. And then down the bottom right, you can cycle through a few different menus, though really all it shows is range and fuel consumption. That's it. My one complaint about the instrument cluster is that it's actually quite dim, as is the infotainment display. And the only reason that is, is because for whatever stupid reason, and Toyota have not fixed this even though they've known about it, the light sensor for this, about how dim and how bright it should go, is right down the bottom left-hand corner in the darkest, dingiest corner. Sun never hits it, and as a result, it's always too damn dark. Thankfully though, I don't really have to look much at the instrument cluster because you do have a nice big bright heads up display which works beautifully too. And there's also another thing Toyota hasn't fixed. There's always been a lot of buffeting and wind noise when you put the windows down. Can you hear that? Horrible. And even though they've known about it for a year, they could have fixed it with this refresh. They haven't. And that's really, really poor taste in my opinion. We might as well talk about the infotainment screen. Yeah, it's really dim and dark and it can be hard to see, especially in bright light. But there is good news and that is that it's a BMW iDrive system, which is one of the easiest intuitive systems to use. It is very functional, it has digital radio, it does have navigation and I have been using that a lot, even though I hate using manufacturer's systems navigation, but I have to use it because even though it has Apple CarPlay, it does not have Android Auto. But amazingly, I can confirm navigation works really, really well. So uh, I'm not gonna complain too much, but it really, really should have Android Auto. It is a, it, it's just stupid. We could figure out how to get someone onto the moon 60 years ago, but we can't figure out how to put Android Auto on this system, boo. Thankfully it is a touch screen though, and you can use the iDrive controller down here. So at least it works very intuitively and very well. And connected to the infotainment screen is a JBL sound system. Really not that great, but eh, it's all right. I'll tell you what I love though, and that's these optional Alcantara seats. Now, they are completely unnecessary. If you get one of these, you don't need it. The black leather that comes as standard is great. But these, just, these are just awesome. They look great, they feel great, of course, and they're very comfortable and supportive over longer journeys. I've done a few hundred kilometers now, quite a few hundred kilometers, sorry Toyota, in the Toyota Supra, and, and yeah, I love it. The seats are also heated, which is a nice touch, not cooled, that's a shame. And then in terms of boot space, you have 296 liters of boot space, which is a lot, but you have such a narrow opening to get stuff in. But as I said, I've gone on a, a road trip for a few days and gone heaps of stuff in there, it's, it's great. Enough though about the interior, let's get on to how this thing drives. <laughs> And it is just a fiend. It is incredible. Now, I don't know if this is placebo or not. I can't tell, but the stiffening, I feel it's done a good job because this thing handles just incredibly well. And it's, <laughs> it's, oh, it's incredible. I'm lost for words. It is, it's just so precise. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, the stiffening and bracing comes from a couple of strut bars they've put up in the engine bay, and it works very well, let me tell you. And a question people want to know, is this super faster now than it was in 2020? Well, oh, I can't tell you, I don't know, <laughs> but, well, but it, it, it doesn't feel much faster. There has been a bit more done, though, to the way it drives. There's been some retune of the dampers in the car, and. And, and a bit of a change to the electronics, so it won't let you slip out apparently as much anymore, but I don't know, it's, it's almost unnoticeable, except for I feel it handles just even better than before, and it handled incredibly well. Not much of a difference, but something. The suspension tuning too is, is awesome. Right now, I'm in sport mode. I should mention driving modes. There's, there's just two. There's comfort or normal, and then there's individual sport. So there isn't a sport mode with you know track mode, anything like that. Individual, you can set it up how you want it. Which, to be honest, is <laughs> it's how it should be. Now, right now, I am driving around in that sport mode, and I've set everything to full fat 100% including the suspension, but it is so comfortable, even with sports suspension on. This does have adaptive dampers, and it just soaks up the road in front of you. It is just perfect 
for this back road touring. It's not too stiff. I don't feel like I'm gonna throw up in any way that you can get in some of these really high performance sports cars. It does a fantastic job. But then if I do put it into comfort mode and, and I wanna take things a little bit easier, it becomes the perfect daily driver. You know, you feel like you have so much potential under your foot and you can absolutely go screaming if you wanted to, but you don't have to because it almost feels serene in here how comfortable it is. For those who don't know, the Toyota Supra gets a lot of hate because under the skin, it's a BMW and it's true, it is. But BMW makes some of the best driver's cars and this is no exception. In fact, it handles even better than the BMW Z4. It's just got a better handling tune to it. And in my opinion, it is one of the best sports cars you can buy out there. So let's get on to the topic of, is it worth it? I think you guys know what I'm gonna say here. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> it is absolutely, it is worth it. The thing about the Toyota Supra is it gets so much right and it does it at a pretty fair price point. If you have a look at its competitors, the Porsche Cayman, the C8 Corvette, a C8 Corvette in Australia, you can't really get one, but when they were selling here for a very limited window before Holden, know, pulled out of Australia, General Motors for those who aren't aware, well, it would set you back at least 150,000 Australian dollars. And you look at the Porsche Cayman, they start the cheapest zero optioned Porsche. Imagine that, that's 130,000 Australian dollars. Whereas the top spec Toyota Supra I'm driving here with all the optional extras, the Alcantara seats and the beautiful paint job, that's 110,000 Australian dollars drive away. And really you can get them substantially cheaper than that. And so yes, with a minimum saving of 20,000 Australian dollars, yeah, it's worth it. It matches the performance of those two cars. In some ways, it betters the performance, especially against the base model Cayman. It is truly a magical, magnificent car. It turns heads like no tomorrow. I've never driven a car where more people break their necks, point, take photos. It's nuts. And for good reason, it's a beautiful car and it's a great car. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you did like the video, please hit that like button. Comment down below, what do you think of the 2021 Toyota Supra? Of course, subscribe and hit that notification bell. I release an awesome new car review like this every single week. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next week.